Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Bio 112. I'm your host, Dr. Nelson Garayas. Um, this is um, the um, lecture addenda for day one, May 9, Monday. So let's um, open up your uh, Holes Human Anatomy textbook. It's inside your um, your course shell. You can check into modules. Uh, shoot me an email if you can't find it or still having trouble. And then once you open it up, um, uh, you can go to the table of contents and we're going into uh, unit one, chapter two, the chemical basis of life. Let me close this down. So again, uh, you could either look at the PowerPoints. Um, um, and I'll I'll briefly go over the PowerPoints as uh, as well um, during this recording. So we already know the importance of chemistry because when we looked at the big picture, we saw atoms that makes molecules that makes macromolecules. If you recall that picture, maybe they still have it here. No, I can bring it up here. Uh, these are not the right words. Here you go. Here's something similar that what we were looking at uh, yesterday. Where's the picture? Are they tricking us? Love how they trick us. Oh, that's like, but we can look at this. And what is chemistry actually? If you look at, because that's important definition, because once you've defined what something is, then you'll understand it, uh, understand uh, what it is. Um, and it's part of the physiology of the human body. So uh, we got to look at what makes up this person called a human being. It's the relationship between these atoms, molecules, and macro macromolecules, and then that uh, creates organelles and cells. We already went over that yesterday. And uh, we're going to be talking about bonds. Um, I mentioned yesterday in my lecture, uh, part of my never ending stream of odd and bizarre thoughts, especially as a child. And one of my thoughts as a child was, you know, you watch cartoons and stuff like that. And I wonder why when I jump in the swimming pool, I don't fall apart. And um, that's chemistry. And it starts with the definition. And if you look here, oh, another set of uh, medical terms we're gonna go over in a minute. You look at why is it important? Because it is how things get put together, like the glue of what holds us all together. So it states here in your textbook, it's the composition of substances. And we already know that they change. Those changes are called reactions or chemical reactions. And we already know that things have to change because our living existence requires metabolism. If you recall the word metabolism, meta means change, bowl is growth. And the only way we can grow is to change, not only metaphysically, but actually physically, right? Um, the, what did I have this morning? <coughs> I, had, oh, I had dry toast. I had dry toast and uh, some milk, yeah. But dry toast and milk, that's not what my body needs. It needs the substances that it's composed of. Therefore, my body has to meta change it and in order to grow. Now, chemistry has different um, uh, distinctions and different departments. And one of the ones that we're very, very interested in is in biochemistry. And we know bio coming from the word biology, logi, study of bio. So uh, we'll also be talking about the chemistry of bio, a life. So that's the importance. And uh, look at these, we'll be mentioning these um, um, 
shortly as we're uh, as we're going down um, uh, going down the lecture. But you see where I'm going to get all of your questions from medical terminology right here, right in the understanding word section in the first part of every chapter. And also in the last part of every chapter <coughs> as well. Okay. So what's matter? It's anything that takes up space. Okay. So solid, liquid, gas. We, we know that from, um, uh, from grade school and from high school. Well, the atoms we know on our diagram that we saw, it's the smallest element. Well, subatomic uh, particles are smallest, but for our intents and purposes regarding biochemistry, the atom is the smallest particle in our diagram. And it's made up of certain things, electrons, protons, neutrons. So, you know, I like these summaries. They're really nice. So let's look at a picture. This is a diagram of lithium. Lovely drug. Uh, it's actually used for uh, bipolar and other things. And amongst other things. And if we look at this diagram, in the middle here, you have these particles that have no charge, zero, zero, zero. They're neutral, hence they're called a neutron. Then you have these positively charged particles, that's called a proton. Both of these are in the nucleus. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? And you could really, it goes, don't have to memorize it, just know the picture. And then on these outer rings of energy, those are electrons. So, and they're connoted by these little minus signs. Okay, so an atom is composed of neutrons, protons, and electrons. What's in the nucleus? Elect um, protons and neutrons. What's in the outer shell? Electrons. Now, the most outer shell is called your valence. V-A-L-E-N-C-E, -E, that's your valence. And I want you to think of these electrons as energy. So that's what you are. You're comprised of all of these. And like we mentioned in yesterday's lecture, you got a problem with this stuff, or you got a problem with the subatomic level, you're gonna have a problem with everything else, okay? So the number of protons, is called the atomic number. So in uh, if I gave you an example of lithium and I gave you a model, right? The atomic number would be one, two, three. Hydrogen only has one, so its atomic number is one. Carbon has six protons, therefore its atomic number is six. Very simple. Now, how heavy is an atom. Well, that's called the atomic weight. Okay. So um, how do we calculate uh, the weight of a uh, weight of an atom? Now, the electrons have almost little to no weight. They're very, very light, and they don't contribute to the, uh, the atomic weight. It is the nucleus that uh, determines the atomic weight. Okay, so number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So in lithium, I have how many protons? One, two, three. How many neutrons? One, two, three, four. Therefore, its atomic weight is seven. Okay, and we could do that. Uh, and don't you think that would be a wonderful question? And that does come out in, in, in certain exams. Now, how do you know things radi radiate energy? Remember the electrons we talk about energy? How do you know they're radioactive? Well, there are certain substances that have um, different numbers and they're called isotope. So they have the same atomic number, right? Protons and electrons. But remember we talked about, I mean, uh, um, 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 they may vary a little bit 
in atomic weight. So here's some examples of, of, of isotopes. Radioactive isotopes are very common, um, especially in the radiology field, especially if we're um, um, like trying to diagnose cancer or we're doing, um, um, what do you call that, uh, experiments. Um, when I was a chemist, I worked in a um, biochemistry laboratory for a couple of years, and we messed around with stuff like this iodine uh, isotope, iodine-131. It's different from the, your normal iodine. That's why you have this extra number here. And it's an isotope, and it's radioactive. And it's uh, we used to count it uh, with um, this thing called the scintillation counter. Now, we could use that. For example, I could attach iodine-131. I could put it in your bloodstream in, a, uh, in another chemical, and I could diagnose and find where your uh, where exactly your cancer is. And um, my research, we used it, we induced cancer in rats and bunnies um, to do uh, research regarding the properties of cancer um, for uh, the thyroid. And I did that for a couple of years. And we used these isotopes. So an isotope is a radioactive thing. We use other stuff like tritium. And here's another one, iron 59. Gallium 67, thallium. Now you'll also see this word half-life. Half-life means it's, um, its ability to decay. Um, uh, what does half-life mean? Like, let's say, for example, I had a stick of butter that was 100 grams. Well, that stick of butter uh, within the first hour would melt half of it. So that would be down to 50 grams. And then in the next hour, it would be you know, uh, that 50 grams that is still solid will then go to 25. And then it, it's mathematical. Just know that if you see the word half-life, it means that how long does it have for that radioactive material to decay, okay? So that's, uh, those are some examples of isotopes and that's because uh, an isotopes are radioactive and we can pick it up using, uh, using these machines like the scintillation counter. There's also other kinds of scintillation counters like where you put um, the, you know, you swab the patient or you swab the sample and then you put it in little jars and it, it goes in this big like hopper like uh, of a machine. But you could see here, oh, look, for iodine-131, you mentioned, um, we could scan the, uh, the thyroid, right? And also, we also use radioactivity to also kill the cancers because if the iodine-131 can attract itself to the thyroid cancer, um, you know, uh, it'll, do, it'll do damage to normal cells, but it'll also do damage to um, any cancer cells that may be lying around here, okay? And that's what uh, an isotope is, okay? Now, how do they all, how does an atom form a molecule? Now, what's a molecule? It was the next step, because just like what we talked about, you know, cells make tissues, tissues make organs, you know, like you glue a whole bunch of cells together, you make a tissue, you glue a bunch of um, tissues together, you make an organ. Well, you glue a whole bunch of uh, atoms together, you can make molecules. Here's an example, O2, that's oxygen, H2, that's uh, hydrogen gas, right? And I combine hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. I can make the liquid H2O. There's two H's and one O, and that's water. So how do they stick? Well, they stick using this stuff called bonds. And remember when we mentioned the electrons, this stuff on the outer shell? It's floating around here. Here's the nucleus, and then uh, here's the nucleus, here's the nucleus, and then all these little blue things are going around like a planet, you know, like a moon encircling a planet. And these electrons have energies. These electron shells, these energies start bumping into each other and forming things. And they can borrow stuff. 
the classic example of an ionic bond. Now, first we've got to talk about what's an ion. Well, normally the overall charge of an atom should be neutral because there'll be, um, you know, there'll be an equal amount of protons and an equal amount of electrons. But in nature, it's not always the case. Sometimes you have one less electron or one less negative charge. Therefore, the total charge will be uh, uh, plus one. So you have, let's count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have 10 electrons and 11 protons. So if I add 11 plus negative 10, my overall charge would be plus one. And that's why you see sodium ion is plus one. Now ions, either if they're plus, they're missing an electron. And that makes sense. Therefore you call it plus. And sodium is an ion and it's highly reactive. Na plus or plus one. Now chlorine, if you look here, it's got an extra one. It has an extra electron. So if it has an extra electron, then chlorine will be designated Cl minus or Cl, and then one is understood. So an Na plus and an Cl minus, so sodium plus a chloride ion, you get an ionic bond because then they share, and then you get table salt, which is sodium chloride. And this is the classic example of an ionic bond. And it's relatively weak. And we know that because what happens if I put salt in water? It'll break this up. It'll move the sodium out and chlorine out. It'll separate them. And that's why when you put table salt in a glass of water, it disappears. But it didn't really disappear. It just disassociated itself into a sodium ion and a chloride ion, and then it's now no longer sodium chloride. It's no, no longer table salt. <clears throat> okay, and here's a nice salt crystal of sodium chloride. And a classic example of an ionic bond. Now, sodium plus is called a cation. Chlorine minus is called an anion. So whenever you have like um, opposites, cation versus anion, memorize one like you're like dependent on it and um, the other one uh, is just simply the other one. For me, I don't like, I guess I don't like cat so that, I, that, that might mess me up. But when I look at the word cation, the T forms a cross and it reminds me, oh, that's plus. And anion, uh, another student a couple of years ago told me she remembered it this way. She hates onions. Looks like the word onions. She goes, onions are nasty, she said. So whatever you need to do to make it your own so that you can remember. Because what happens during the exam? You start playing mind games with yourself. Which one's which? So a good example, if I said, um, is sodium a cation or an anion? And it's sodium plus, and you'll tell me, cation. <coughs> uh, chloride, uh, negative, chlorine, negative one, that's an anion. And those are both ions. And they come together, they form an ionic bond, a relatively weak bond, and then they can make table salt. Now, the next kind of bond we're going to be talking about is covalent. If you're looking at the word covalent, and we already talked about valence, which is the outer shell of uh, electrons. So covalent means co, what happens? When you co-pilot, you share the responsibility of flying that plane. Or if you cohabitate with somebody, right? That means you both live in the same place. So that's what this hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen atom doesn't live alone. Okay, it can't. And that's how you form bonds and stuff. So in nature, they don't have enough to fill this whole valence, but they can share. So in nature, hydrogen ions get together to form H2, 
which is hydrogen gas. <clears throat> now, do you see how the hydrogen's here? This is one hydrogen. This is another hydrogen. Do you see how they are nonpolar? Meaning they share and they share equally, nonpolar, right? But if you look at water, H2, there's two H's, and O, it's lopsided. The O wins a little bit more. Look, it's much bigger. So this is a different, this is, this is polar covalent. So an example of covalent, hydrogen bond, or even oxygen, O2. But water, H2O, you can see here, O2, which is right here, it's even, Steven, symmetrical. But if you look at this water molecule, it's asymmetrical, therefore it is polar covalent. So let's review real quick. What, and oh, here's, here's what they look like if you write them down on paper. H2, O2, look at that. Look how even Steven they are. And these are nonpolar covalent. But you look at this water, right? it's uh, polar covalent. Look at this carbon dioxide, very, very, very symmetrical. So it is um, nonpolar. It's sharing equally. Okay. Now, the polar covalent example of water gives water very interesting properties. <clears throat> it gives the oxygen a slightly negative side and it gives the hydrogen side of water a slightly positive side. And you'll see that by this uh, symbol called delta. Let me show you what that looks like. If you look at the typical uh, water molecule, the oxygen has a partial negative charge and the hydrogen part of water has a partial positive charge. And that's how um, uh, water can pull apart salt because there's a part of it that's negative and a part of it is positive and it'll pull away salt. And then salt therefore is soluble or dissolvable in water or in an aqueous solution. And here is an example of kind of what it, how it does it. See how the hydrogen ions kind of get attracted to the to the negative of the of your chlorine, right? And the oxygen part gets attracted to the positive part, uh, sodium. Therefore, it pulls apart the sodium chloride and then it ceases to become salt. And this is a wonderful property because how do you think we get drugs in you? Using this property, it pulls it apart so I can put it in an aqueous form and I could uh, shoot it in you in an IV. And then I could get you some, uh, not only some water, I can get you some salt if you need it. And they're cousins, they always go together. Water and salt always go together. We'll talk more about that later. So if I show you uh, uh, or ask you which part of the water molecule is the slightly negative end or the partially negative, you'll tell me oxygen. And which is the partial positive, hydrogen. Now, another neat thing that water does is form hydrogen bonds. They are very, very weak. They're even weaker than ionic bonds, right? So it goes hydrogen bond, weakest, um, ionic, and then uh, um, um, polar covalent, and then nonpolar. So there's different things, different types of glue, different types of bonds. And those are the reactions. I mean, those are the um, types of bonds. Next is your reactions. Oh, the one thing I forgot to remind you guys um, uh, while um, um, before, you know, if I'm going too fast, you can pause it and watch 
and then uh, try to get the gist of it. And you still don't get it, give me a call. All right. Next are reactions. Remember metabolism. Things have to change so that we can get energy so we can still stay alive. Well, the way things change are these types of chemical reactions. And it always starts with um, a product, which is on the left side of this arrows, right? I mean, a reactant, which is on the left side is, uh, of these arrows, and then products, okay? All right, sorry, I had to read a uh, uh, email. I am multitasking, I shouldn't be doing that. So let's look at the different types of, uh, of reactions. So you have a synthesis reaction. What happens in synthesis? If we look at the, uh, the prefix syn, S-Y-N, it means together. So if you have a syndrome like AIDS or Down syndrome, there's a whole bunch of things that come together as a confluence to make that particular disease. Well, in this reaction, if I had a uh, reactants A plus B, it makes AB. It glues two things together, and that's called a synthesis reaction. The exact opposite of that reaction is called a decomposition reaction. It has to break down stuff. Another one, a little bit more complicated, but not much more, is exchange. AB plus ZCD. Do you see what happens? The A combines with the D, the B combines with the C, and it forms two different products. <clears throat> if you see the arrow going both ways, um, that means it's a reversible reaction. So this is a synthesis reaction that can go to a decomposition. It can go the other way. Okay. Now, Do, 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 catalyst, no, what's a catalyst? <clears throat> Catalysts are other molecules, and we're gonna be talking about enzymes momentarily, that, that, that influence how fast a chemical reaction can go. For example, um, when we have enzymes that break down things in our stomach and in our mouth, how long does it take for an Egg McMuffin to break down if I just left it on the table. It will take centuries. I don't even think they can break down. But you put it in your mouth, you start chewing on it, all that enzymes or all those chemicals start catalyzing and influencing the rate of decomposition for your food because you're chewing on it and then the enzymes are breaking down the fat. And then when it goes in your stomach, it starts breaking down the protein. And then they have... Your stomach has a lot of acid, and then that breaks it down even more. So that's what a catalyst is, something that speeds up a chemical reaction. Now, acid, base, and salt. Let's look at these definitions. An acid is something that has a lot of hydrogen ions in it, H plus. A base is something that can release a lot of hydroxide ions, which is OH minus. And the substance formed by the reaction between the acid and base, if I put them together, that's called a salt. Okay. Now, how does the pH scale work? P scale runs from zero to 14. And neutral is seven. The further you go down the scale, right? The more acidic something is. So for example, I throw some cow's milk at you, which is like barely, it's, or let's start at distilled water. I throw distilled water at you. You'll be mildly annoyed and like, oh, well, you're throwing stuff at me. It's not really going to react with you or anything, you know, not going to damage you. Same thing with cow's milk or cabbage juice. <coughs> <coughs> but if we start moving down the line, 
the acid in your stomach, which is gastric acid, that can, it's highly reactive. It can um, probably melt the paint off your car. Not probably, it will melt the paint off your car. So the stronger the acid, the lower the number. Seven is neutral. So I could ask you, um, my patient has, uh, um, um, no, uh, a substance has a pH of 5.3. Substance A has uh, 5.3. Substance B has 3.0. Who's more acidic? Substance B, because it has a lower number. The same can be said for something that's basic or alkaline. If I'm here at neutral, distilled water, egg white, right? And you see human blood? It's supposed to be in the middle. We've talked about homeostasis. Makes sense. 7.4, well, actually, it's like 7.35 to 7.45, something like that. That is what they call physiologic pH. Human beings are supposed to be where? In the middle. So we can't be acidic, nor can we be basic or alkaline. We can't have too much H plus ion. We can't have too much OH minus. And by the way, here's some Illuminati stuff for you. What if I put H plus and OH minus together? What do I get? H2O, I get water, okay? Now, how does your body control homeostasis? Your body controls homeostasis. It keeps you in the middle through buffers. And what's a buffer? A buffer is a weak acid or a weak base. Here's an um, example of a very weak base, sodium bicarbonate. And maybe you've heard of that, you know, when people put a line in your sodium bicarb. So let's say, for example, my patient's a little bit acidic on this side. I give my patient sodium bicarb. What happens? Boop, 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 boop. They start moving towards here. What happens if my uh, patient is a little bit alkaline or basic? Their blood, is, their, their blood pH is around here. What happens? I have to give them something like Ringer's lactate. If you look at the word lactate, anything with the thing A-T-E at the end or a suffix of A-T-E, like lactate, that means it's lactic acid, right? Aspartate, as, uh, aspartic acid. Um, uh, um, oh, A-S-A, aspirin. Uh, acylosate is what? Acilic, uh, acilic, acilic acid, say that eight times fast, right? So let's say my patient is a little bit on the basic alkaline side. I give them Ringer's lactate or something acidic, doop, 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 doop. They try to get you in the middle. We also do that with your diet. That's why in the hospital, um, we give you things like that orange juice that tastes like battery acid. It's a little bit on the acidic side or uh, that really, really uh, uh, yucky, um, what do you call it? It's like, uh, it's like buttermilk, Ugh. right? That's never good. But what are we doing? Remember, the food in the hospital is not there for your enjoyment. The food in the hospital there is part of your management of how to get you well, okay? So what questions could come out? I could ask you, I could give you a pH, you tell me if it's acidic or basic. I could ask about the ions. H plus if it's acidic, hydroxide if it's basic. Another word for basic is alkaline. Where should we be? Neutral. Where's human beings? 7.4, which is really close to what? Seven. Okay. It's the worst I could do to you. Uh, and they go like this. The reason why there's numbers like this, because what does pH really mean? pH really means the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. So for example, if it's really, really small, like times 10 to the negative 14, that means it's basic. But if it's really like uh, times, uh, times 10 to the negative one, right, concentration, uh, it's really, really acidic. So a lot of hydrogen ion, acid, a lot of hydroxide ion base, somewhere in the middle is neutral, not somewhere, it's neutral seven. And um, <clears throat> human beings, physiologic pH is at 7.4, okay? Now we've been talking about inorganic substances like salt, right? But there's also organic compounds 
which um, deal specifically with biochemistry and with life. Okay. So, uh, and inorganic uh, substances like salt, they tend to dissolve in water and they can form ions because, and uh, those ions um, are also known as electrolytes. Okay, those salts are called electrolytes, like the stuff that Gatorade keeps on touting that's really good for replenishing your body. Well, funny story. Can't get away with, um, without telling you guys stories. Years ago, it was like 20 years ago, Gatorade wanted um, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine to endorse, to endorse their product. So they, they gave them a stipend to go do research um, on how, uh, how important Gatorade is, is to replenish uh, uh, electrolytes upon um, you know, strenuous exercise in professional athletes. Guess what the American College of Sports Medicine found? That um, water was the best thing. Your body will replenish itself if you properly hydrate yourself. Yep. And then, and then uh, right at that moment, they, of course, dropped their endorsement. Remember, can't mess with science, but Gatorade, you know, will always will forever be, you know, the drink that you pour in your coach. <clears throat> I wish I was in a sport where we get to do that. I can only imagine if I ever did that to my wrestling coach, he'd murder me. So water. Now let's talk about Gator, not Gatorade. Let's talk about Kool-Aid. So what's Kool-Aid when you think about it? is water plus the powder, and it makes a solution. The water is called the solvent, and the powder is called the solute. So there could be a whole bunch of mixtures, and we could do the same thing with drugs, and also blood, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, let's look at this, inorganic substances. Uh, Sodium chloride, hydrogen. So your body is composed of both inorganic and organic. But the inorganic compounds just know that um, the inorganic ions, they're supposed to be in small amounts. Like you shouldn't have tons of magnesium in you or uh, 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 calcium or calcium carbonate. You shouldn't have tons of it. Now. What are some organic substances? There are four groups, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Those are the organic substances. It goes, and all of them are made up of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and uh, with proteins and nucleic acids, they also have nitrogen. In it. And that's why proteins, the, um, the uh, medical slang abbreviation for a protein is C-H-O-N because it contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And the, um, the shorthand for carbohydrates is C-H-O <clears throat> because as you can see here, they're made up of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens. Now, when you see something like this, just know that each point here, there's a carbon, right? So this glucose molecule has one, two, three, four, five carbons, right? Okay. Well, actually glucose is six carbons. But this ring, that's how you read it. These little points are carbons. Make your life easy. So carbohydrates, also known to you and I as sugars. You have simple sugars called monosaccharides, uh, doubled up sugars called disaccharides. And then if you have a whole bunch of sugars, all linked together, that's called a polysaccharide, okay? Now, I don't want to mention starch, okay? Um, let's get into this. When you drink starchy foods, humans can easily digest that, and they can make fat out of it. It's the one thing why we always promote that you eat leafy green vegetables or like corn, uh, like celery. So when you eat corn and celery and all that, it's got tons of cellulose or plant matter. 
So that polysaccharide that's abundant in plants, you cannot di digest it. Um, next time you have corn on the cob, what, ha what happens? You eat a whole ton of corn on the cob, what happens? What comes out in the toilet? Corn doesn't really change much. But the cool thing about non-digestible cellulose or plant or uh, plant polysaccharide is that on its way down to be digested, it scrapes away cholesterol, which contains fat. And it takes that out of your system. And that's what's so neat about um, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? Eating roughage eating plant-based material it's it's really good for you and it cleans you out because remember excessive fat leads to a whole bunch of things not only uh, i i didn't mention it in yesterday's lecture excessive fat not only leads to stuff like hypertension cholesterolemia and all that other stuff it's also the cause of many cancers um so you know think about that for a little bit so you got monosaccharides like this glucose it's just one Disaccharides, they're two sugars, two simple sugars put together. And a polysaccharide is a whole bunch. Now, part of that carbohydrates is starch. And we know starch uh, uh, promotes, um, um, if you eat a lot of starchy foods, it, um, it promotes uh, storage. And the storage form is called lipid. Okay, it is not soluble in water because it's fat. And you can see why. If you look at these fatty acids, you have saturated and unsaturated. And unsaturated has these double bonds, right? You could see how these pluses will repel the plus side of water and it won't mix with it. Unlike, you know, uh, unlike the salt that we mentioned before. And then it's going to form a triglyceride, right? You have the glycerol section with three long fatty acid chains. This is another thing. Your TGs is another thing we measure when we're looking at your uh, lipid profile. Every time you hear the word profile in medicine, it means you're looking at a whole bunch of tests that are related. So I'm going to be looking at your HDL, which is your high-density lipoprotein, LDL, low-density lipoprotein, VLDL, very low-density lipoprotein, total cholesterol and your TGs with your triglycerides. So if you got a lot of TGs, triglycerides, that means you got a lot of uh, fatty acids that are being stored because this is stored for future energy. Now in caveman days or cave woman days, um, you have to forage for food and you had to, the things that you had to do and the energy you had to deplete to get food was massive. But nowadays in modern times, like uh, you don't even walk very far and um, you don't even have, have to do too much to get food. Uh, any one of us uh, uh, who's ever been hunting, uh, I hate hunting. I love shooting, I'm going to the range, but I hate hunting. It's so boring and it's long and it's wet and it's cold. You get lost and you burn a lot of energy just for that little amount of meat when you finally get what you need to go. Um, you know, besides, you know, a lot of people believe in the cruelty of it all uh, for sport. Um, but, you know, you go hunting, you better eat what you got. Uh, lesson I learned when I was a kid. Which, I don't know, sometimes gamey. But I'd rather just go hunting in video games. So what kind of question can I ask you about lipids? Lipids are part of carbohydrates. You have too much carbohydrates, too much sugars, then you'll store it in the form of lipids and in the form of triglycerides. Now, I just mentioned earlier, like um, VLDL and LDL. Very low density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein. Lipo meaning fat. Now, these proteins are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Think of them as little trucks or little buses. 
The VLDL and the LDL are little trucks or little buses that bring in cholesterol into your body, bring in fat for storage. That's why if you have tons of those trucks, it's an indication that your diet is very poor and very rich in fat. And HDL is the truck that takes cholesterol and fat out of the cell. That's why you don't have too many HDLs. Because remember, in cave person days, you don't know when you're going to eat. So you need to be able to conserve energy as much as possible. Um, classic example, if you look at the Inuit Native American peoples uh, in Alaska, it's very cold. Meta their metabolism is very slow. They're, they're very, it goes there. They have a lot of problems now with hypertension and obesity because their diet is fat, not only fat laden because it's cold <coughs> and um, their life is uh, well in the rural areas of, uh, uh, of Alaska and um, Northern parts of uh, Canada, the, their life is very, very difficult. So their ability, they have to have the genetic ability to hold in fats. But the problem is, especially nowadays, right? We now know this is directly related to um, heart disease. And as I mentioned, cancers. Now what's a protein? Protein is a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now, what do they do, right? Well, we're gonna talk more about it in Friday's lecture uh, where uh, the amino acids, right? Get put together through something called the peptide bond and they make proteins. And proteins do a whole bunch of things. So what's a protein made out of? Amino acids. What's the bond that connects it? It's called the peptide bond. The amino, mass, amino acids make a specific chain so we can do specific things. And, and, and the structure makes specific things like coiled structures. And that does that look familiar, like in DNA. Also pleated structures, uh, like in um, beta and alpha sheets of your connective tissue. And even three-dimensional structures like um, that can even go into a quaternary structure, right? And the classic example of that is <coughs> hemoglobin. Hemoglobin takes these sheets and these cold structures and then mix and matches them. And then they form these little seats. And that's what hemoglobin, hemo meaning blood, globin meaning protein. That's the thing that's in the middle of your red blood cell that carries oxygen, carbon dioxide in and out of your cells. And it also carries proteins and sugars in and out of your cells. Maybe you've heard of uh, hemoglobin A1C or glycosylated hemoglobin. That's the little chair that, uh, that um, sugar likes to ride on. And that can give the doctor an indication of um, up to 90 days how your sugar intake is. So you can tell the doctor all day, doc, I didn't have my coffee. I'm not having any sweets. And then I look at your A1C and it's like 7.3, 7.4. And then I tell what's up, you're lying to me. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to your physician. They got labs on their side. They have science on their side. They're gonna find you out. And it's not helping any. I can't help you if you're not honest. I love when, I love when patients try to hide stuff from me because I'll find it. The last category of organic compounds are your nucleic acids. That's your DNA and your RNA. And I mentioned in class, the DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid, is the blueprint of who you are. And what do I mean by that? We're gonna talk more about that on Friday. It is everything on who you are. Your eye color, your, um, are you gonna have kinky hair or, um, or, or, or flat hair? Are you gonna be tall or are you gonna be short? Are you gonna be sick? Are you gonna be healthy? It also tells you the potential, and I mentioned it in class yesterday, according to the American Psychiatric Association and their latest findings, 40% of behavior is also encoded in your DNA. <clears throat> now, does it necessarily mean, you know, uh, if you're encoded to be a, uh, an alcoholic, you're gonna be an alcoholic? No. If you know your history, your family history, and that's the reason why we take social history 
and family history so that we could see patterns. And the, those patterns are definitely um, now scientifically proven to be genetic, right? Um, I, I probably didn't mention this, but I'll probably mention it at least five more times in this course. Um, Garias males, we're all drinkers, we're all smokers. We're all heart attack patients waiting to happen. Out of all the Garias males over the age of 25, and I told you my cousin just had a heart attack and he's 26. He's not my cousin, he's like my uh, like a nephew, like once removed, but he still is a Garias. Had a heart attack, he's 26. That's messed up. But he's a smoker, he's a drinker. So I was a smoker and drinker. What do I have to now do? Stop that. I, got, I, I have to counterbalance my genetics, right? And uh, that's what we're all trying to do uh, for ourselves and for our patients. Now, what's RNA? We have messenger RNA and transfer RNA. We're gonna be talking about more about that um, um, uh, on Friday. Just know that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid is uh, the blueprint of who you are and has a code that's nice and tightly wound and it is everything. It's everything, um, all the messages to your cells on what to do with all the instructions. That's why it's called the blueprint of who you are because what's a blueprint of a house? It says everything, where all the wires go, um, what color is the ceiling and uh, whatnot. <coughs> Okay, here's a nice little summary. I don't like this general form, but hey, this is good. This looks good. We have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. It's protein. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, a phosphate group. So that's nucleic acid. Here's examples. The big example protein, hemoglobin. Hemo means blood, globin means um, uh, protein, medical terminology. I could also add that. Oh, by the way, anything that's a sugar has OSE on the end of it. So glucose, sucrose, lactose, galactose, oh, anything, just OSE. Oh, and um, glycogen is the storage, is one of the, your storage forms of glucose. Fat is also another storage form. PET scan, uh, not important. Okay, and we're in the end. So look at the end with the chapter uh, uh, summaries. Doesn't this look like how I make, uh, how I can ask a question? Don't even have to ask yourself, what's the question? This question is right here. Find the answers and then do what? Make a multiple choice out of it. It's essentially how I make my exams. Okay. Chapter summary, right? When you take when you're taking notes, listening to my lecture, does it look like this? You know, in an organized fashion. Okay. So let's look at uh, now. Um, uh, the um, um, the PowerPoints because uh, some people also uh, like PowerPoints. Um, what's the more the that's it. Moment. Always remember to bring your cell phone so that you can. Run your authenticator. Almost forgot that yesterday. <clears throat> so if I'm here in my course and I'm going to student view. So I'm in my course. Um, I could look up the modules. I'm looking down here and I'm doing chapter two. So I can go down here. I'm still on unit one because the unit one lectures. 
And here's some additional resources as well. Check, click on those, click on everything. You go to chapter two, boop. Oh, look at here. Didn't we talk about this? Oh, I forgot to mention the difference between mass and weight. Mass is how much matter is present, okay? But weight is the effects of the gravitational pull on this mass. So for example, my mass is of, oh, I don't wanna say, I wish my mass was, how's this, 70 kilograms, right? I wish I was 70 kilograms, right? Uh, so no matter where I am, I could be on Jupiter, I could be um, on Mars, my mass is 70 kilograms but the weight of 70 kilograms on earth is very different than the weight of 70 kilograms or the gravitational pull on Mars or the moon or whatever. Atoms, protons, see, you can see it's, PowerPoints are essentially the, uh, the synopsis of uh, those lecture notes. They almost look identical. Lovely picture. Can you take this and like erase whatever you need to erase? But it's easy, it already tells you plus proton, zero or nothing, you're neutral, minus electron. And you see how they made the electrons so small because they're, they're, they don't contribute to the, uh, uh, to the weight of this atom, okay? Oh, lithium here, this is your pure lithium. Lithium in real life exists as an ion in three plus. So it has three extra um, uh, protons. Atomic number, mass numbers, all well and good. Here's some, um, eh, nice to know. Glucose, if ever, if ever you see uh, C6H1206. Actually, that's a formula for sugars. So let's say the sugar was um, ribose. That'd be C5H10O5. So it's like X times and X times two and then X. But you now know by just looking at it, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Oh, that's gotta be, um, <clears throat> that's gotta be a carbohydrate. Hence the term carbohydrate. What's hydrate? Water. And it's always two hydrogens for every one oxygen. Different chemical bonds, definitions. See, it's the same thing. Um, I, I forgot who was asking me yesterday, like, will you be going over the PowerPoints? Yet, in, in a way, when I go over the, the book and its outline, it's the PowerPoints. But Know how you study. Some people like taking notes more, which I highly suggest because like I stated in class, when you're doing something active and active listening and writing it down, it, it kind of gets into your brain a little bit better. Okay. So you could see it's the same exact thing. All right. With that said, um uh, make sure to uh, email me give me uh give me a call my number there goes directly to a voicemail um which i check and like i said uh just like what you guys what i always give uh advice to you guys the first thing i do when i wake up in the morning is check my emails and check my voicemails the last thing i do at night is uh check my voicemails check my emails and and, and um i've shared with some of you that i'm a business person as well I have little side businesses, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do to make ends meet. Um, if I don't check my emails and get back to my clients, how am I supposed to make money? If I don't check my emails and get back to my students and my patients, how am I, how am I supposed to be a better teacher or, or a better, uh, better clinician? So the whole world doesn't act like that, but you, uh, true professionals act like that. All right, with that being said, that's chapter two. I'll see you guys tomorrow on Wednesday um, uh, in uh, room 401. All right, have a good one.